Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Jackie Linton. She's the president of JLHR Solutions, a full service human resources consulting company and the president of the Philadelphia chapter of the Society of Human Resource Management, otherwise known as Philly Sherm. Jackie, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much, Laura, for having me. Give us a quick overview. What does what does SHRM, of course, we've got the acronym, but tell us about what it is, what it does, and who it's for. Yeah. So SHRM is the largest um, membership organization for HR professionals, I believe, in the world. They have about 300,000 members worldwide, and they um, are the experts on best practices related to HR. So Philly Sherm is the Philadelphia regional chapter of um, Sherm, and it is one of the largest chapters in the whole organization. We have about 1,500 members that um, represent about 500 companies in the Philadelphia region. Um, the chapter has actually been recognized by Sherm as a super mega superior merit chapter, awesome. which, which means a lot in our world. Yes, I would think so. My goodness, because there's a lot of chapters of Sherm, aren't there? There are, there are. And there's only a few that have the size that we have. Um, and considering the fact that there are other chapters in the region, I'm particularly proud of that. That's awesome. How big is the Philly Sherm chapter membership? It's about 1,500 members. Nice. Um, representing about 500 companies. That's awesome. All right. So if you're in HR and you're not a member yet, uh, you need to you're missing a, stay out. to the end. Yes, yes, you're missing out <laughs> on way too many resources. So you need to contact Jackie afterwards. And at the end of the show, we will tell you exactly how to do that. So as the president of, of the Philly Sherm chapter, what are your main job responsibilities? Uh, because it's not a business, it's a membership organization. Right. So this is a very different animal. What are your main responsibilities and who do you need to influence? Yeah, so, you know, ultimately it is the um, HR and business community in the Philadelphia area. Those are the people that we need to provide services to in order to remain relevant. Like I said, there are other chapters in the area that is our competition, if you will. And so we want people to both join our chapter and participate in the um, events and programs that we have to offer. So my role is to really set the strategy for the organization and really lead a 30 person board that delivers the services and resources that we provide. So in terms of influence, um, I have to influence, of course, those 30 HR professionals, but also the HR community so that they will continue to use our services. And finally, from a distance, um, SHRM National, so that they will continue to provide support and funding for the work that we're doing. Yes, yes. And in doing so, what's the biggest communication challenge that you're facing today? Yeah, so... I think the biggest issue is alignment, really making sure that as a board, we are all connected and providing things that make sense to the people who are using them. Um, in, in terms of um, aligning what people need in the community versus what we're offering, just to give you a quick example, yeah. Um, last year, we had this whole big programming effort underway before the pandemic hit about helping organizations figure out how to hire um, returning citizens because, you know, a lot of people weren't able to fill their jobs. There were more jobs available than there were people. We mm -hmm. were in full employment. You know, the pandemic hits, March hits everything changes. Now people aren't hiring anyone at all. Well, we couldn't continue down that path because no one will, would have wanted to use our services. So we immediately had to pivot mm. and think about what did, the, what did the community need now? They needed to know how to change. They needed to know how to work remotely. They needed to know how to engage their employees. So we had to really quickly pivot to make that happen. And pivot, I think, is the word of the decade now. Yeah. It's all of a sudden that that pandemic hit, and it's just, woo! It's it's not a small shift. It's not like a five degree right. uh, pivot. It's it's a hundred and who knows what, but it's, right. it's a big one. So uh, I would imagine that shifting the programming was was quite the big task. And 
30 people is a pretty big board. It is a big board. And, and, you know, I think one of the reasons why we've had so much success is that we have a lot of things going at the same time. And that's why communicating across the board is so important. We don't want um, people to be operating in silos mm. um, where their work is disconnected. And then to our, our client, our customer base, it looks like we don't know what we're doing or it looks like we're really scattered. And I am particularly proud of the fact that we've been able to really hone in on things that are important to our constituents today. Um, just to give you an, another example of that, um, you know, as the pandemic wore on, the people had different needs, right? At first it was like, how do we get people operating from home? Then it's then it was more about how do we manage performance of people who are working from home? And how do I think about when people can come back to work? And so we had to continue to move and shift all during last year as the environment changed. Um, all of our programming had been in person. Well, guess what? We couldn't do that anymore. So it was uh, uh, being adaptable and being able to constantly move and shift um, based on the needs of your constituents, I think was, was one of the most important things we could have done. Absolutely. And, and that's been the, the most commonly experienced OMG situation for everybody in the last year is we just suddenly our, our schedule is wiped clean. All of our yeah. in-person events that we put all this time and money into just got wiped out completely. And now we have to figure out what to do virtual and, and how to engage that way. Right. Totally. Then what specific communication skills did you have to develop in order to be effective in this role? Um, so I think before pandemic and I think during pandemic. Sure. Right. So before pandemic, um, it was really all about alignment. You know, like I said before, mm -hmm. it was, you know, I like like meeting with each one of these committee groups to understand what they were doing. And then because these are volunteers, I mean, these aren't people who you can just say, go do this, go do that. These are volunteers and they're there um, for their own development, as well as their passion for the work. So to meet with each one of them and figure out how to bring alignment between what they're looking to do and what we're looking to do it as, as a chapter. Communicating regularly about who we are, what we're about, why this is important, why this, why now. That's something that people hear me say a lot. Why this, why now? Mm. Right. And that's yes. something that that I talked about a lot. Then when the pandemic hit, the communication needed to shift. Um, we needed to shift our sense of urgency. And I, I have to tell you, um, the biggest thing that that I can point to around that is the idea of setting a vision for what we want it to be in this pandemic. I can give you an example of that. We um, had our symposium, which is a huge event for us. Um, it gets bigger and better every year. Um, it was supposed to happen on March 30th. So needless to say, that was not possible. Yes. Right. So just then, missed it. Just missed it, right? So then it was like, um, when do we change it to, what does it look like? And we started from a place that says, we're gonna take this fabulous program and then we're gonna make it virtual. So I actually challenged the team to think about it differently. Mm. I said, imagine um, going to a wedding and this is the most fabulous wedding you have ever been to in your entire life and you're planning it. So what would you do to create the most fabulous event ever that people would be talking about for months? Um, and so you, as, as they started to think about how they would make it different, all of a sudden we weren't thinking about just changing what we had done. They were literally thinking about doing new and different things. Yes. And we had the, um, the virtual symposium in September and Oh my God, it was a roaring success. Nice. And I, I consider my contribution to that um, of setting the vision, of really helping people to see what it is we were trying to achieve. Yes, yeah, vision and leadership. Look, if you, you A, you have to have the vision, but B, you have to be able to articulate it in a right. way that makes people get it right. and get on board. Otherwise, it, it's just a hallucination. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. But it sounds like you've got some really great successes along the way. What's a mistake that you made or a lesson that you had to learn the hard way? Yeah. So, you know, last year was com 
uh, particularly challenging on a number of fronts, not sure. just because of the pandemic. Okay. But you remember last summer we had a lot of issues um, with um, social unrest after yes. George Floyd passed away yes. or not passed away, yes. was murdered in yes. front of our eyes, right? And so um, everyone was really struck by that. And I, you know, as being a black woman was personally struck by that. And I was more caught in uh, my own personal feelings about it rather than, you know, necessarily thinking about the role that I had to play as a leader of this organization. Sure. And you have grown sons too. I do, I yes. do. And um, so one of the members of our board, a young woman, um, probably in her early to mid twenties, um, sent me an email and said, Jackie, it would be great if you would make a statement about this. And I said to her, you know, what would you have me say? You know, what would I, she said, you need to just make it personal, like tell people how you feel. And that was like a huge um, step for me because number one, it was personal. And number two, I had not done anything like that before. And her challenging me to do that said, you know what, there is a need here that as the leader of this organization, I need to fill. So I wrote this letter that really started with how I felt personally. And I said in the letter that um, I had, I, have, I am the mother of three adult um, black men who, but by the grace of God, could have been George Floyd. Yeah. And, and the whole letter wasn't about that, but it really parlayed into things that I am also feeling very personal about in terms of doing something. Let's not just talk about it with indignation, let's do something about it. Yeah. So I finished the letter with um, a call to action that all of us could adopt. You know, no matter who you were, where you sat, what color you were. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't just about this is right and that's wrong. It's this is what we can do going forward. I was amazed at the reaction that I got to this. And I felt like, so you asked what would I, you know, what was almost a missed opportunity. It was almost missed because because if she hadn't come to me, if she hadn't felt comfortable enough to say that to me, it would clearly have been a missed opportunity. So I walk away from that saying, thank you, Kayla, for reaching out. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, um, I always want to create an organization where people feel comfortable speaking truth to power. Yes. And and speaking truth to me, that that is something that I really learned from that experience. Yes. It's, so it's great that you your people were comfortable enough coming to you and saying you need to do this mm -hmm. and, and being direct with you on it. And uh, the importance of vulnerability sounds like yeah. it is the lesson that is often hard for leaders to learn. There's the fear. Does does vulnerability mean weakness? Right. And there from a semantic level in some ways yes but no the point of strategic vulnerability i think is is about bringing people closer and not just saying hey here's where i'm bad or here's yeah. where you can you know shoot me down or here's where let, let me just you know stand up to the firing squad it's not about that it's it's about being human and that's where we we really make the best connections i think yeah and as a leader you know i've always felt that um my ability to get the best out of the people that i work with is really my claim to fame that is the thing mm. that i feel like is most important to me in terms of being a leader and i have learned over the years i've not always felt this way but I have learned over the years that people are drawn to people that they can connect with. Sure. And sure. I, and so creating that connection with the people that work with me is really um, a goal that I have. And I think it's also about trust, right? And and if you're expecting people to trust you, especially with their feelings about, uh, you know, something as horrible as what happened with George Floyd and and so much of the other unrest that's been going on in the last, well, couple of years to say the least, the yeah to show that you're willing to be vulnerable first, that you're willing to let people in first and you're at the top sets the tone for the yeah. organization that says we should be able to share this. We need to be able to talk about this. I'm leading by example and not just saying I'm the strong adult at the top right. and you know, you come to me and I'll fix everything for you. You be vulnerable, but I'm not, I'm not vulnerable. I have no vulnerability. Uh, that's, and that sets the wrong tones as if you want to be up at the top where I am, then you can't be vulnerable either. Only the lower ranks yeah. should be. So I think that's fabulous that you're able to, to model that kind of strategic vulnerability.
Yeah, um, it was, it, it, and it's hard. <laughs> I'm not going to oh, make any mistake easy. about it, right? <laughs> it was hard for me to do that. Um, I am a very, you know, logical, thoughtful, um, in the head kind of person. Mm. Um, and while I, um, I have those feelings, it's very difficult for me to share them broadly mm -hmm. for whatever the reason. I mean, that's just kind of how I'm wired. Mm -hmm. um, but as I've grown in my career, I have definitely seen the impact that it can have when you are able to do that. Yes. So that's something that, that I have learned. I am learning and I continue to learn. You know, when you think you have, have learned something, what you see, what I see, is there's more for me to learn in that. Yes, yes. Then with all that that there is to learn there and beyond, what's the next big goal for you? And what kind of communication skills will you need to continue to develop to achieve it? Yeah, so, you know, um, I've had a storied career in corporate America where I've been able to do a lot of things. And, um, you know, because of my experience with Philly Sherm and, and other, you know, nonprofit um, roles that I've had, I really want to get more involved in, in creating impact in the Philadelphia community. Um, I see opportunities where I can really use some of the skills that I have um, to really help people who are in very different situations than I've been engaged with before. So for me, the next big thing is around looking for opportunities where I can have a bigger impact in the community overall. Um, and that really um, speaks to this thing about networking. And I know mm. lots of people talk about networking as a way to kind of build your career. I really see that as a way to get more involved, to get more engaged. And I am a firm believer that networking is about giving, not about getting, mm. right? Yes. So, so the challenge for me in this is, is figuring out like, what is it that I have a value to give and who can I connect with that will help me to deliver on that? So that's sort of the next big thing for me. Um, and networking is a, is a key part of that. Are you familiar with the classic book by Bob Berg, The Go, the Go Giver? I am not. It's a great one. And it's uh, as opposed to being a go getter, mm -hmm. the idea is a go giver and that networking is all about establishing the relationships and just, you know, seeing whether it's today, tomorrow, next year, next, whatever it is, who knows where I might be able to offer you a recommendation, uh, a resource like this or yes. something else. And uh, it, it it's not just about okay, we've done networking. Are you going to buy from me? Am I going to buy from you? Is there a sale involved? It has nothing to do with the transactional nature of the right. moment. It's the seed planting of the relationship. And I think when, for people who have anxiety about networking, if they can, uh, it's a great book to skim through. It's mostly anecdotes. You know, you could read it, you know, it over a weekend or while you're sitting on the Peloton or whatever it is that you're doing. <laughs> and just, it's just it's light reading, but the idea of shifting that mentality and saying, okay, you know what, this, this doesn't have to be, painful. This doesn't have to be stressful or super goal driven, like just have a conversation and you just never know where it'll go. Absolutely. Uh, makes it very different. Absolutely. And that's really how I think about networking. Exactly how I think about it. I could have written that book, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, and give you an example. Um, there's a woman who is um, on a committee for Philly Sherm. I don't mm -hmm. work with her directly. Um, she works for a, a board member, right? Okay. But I, um, I did a training session that she was involved in, so I knew who she was. She really wanted to get a recommendation um, to be able to participate in um, certification, mm -hmm. right? So she had asked her board member if she would reach out to me, if the board member would reach out to me and ask me if, if I would do that. And she said, why don't you just ask her? And she goes, well, I don't know. She doesn't know me. Da, da, da. So she said, just try. So she reached out to me, sent me an email, asked me if we could have a conversation. We did. She asked me if I would do it. I was like, absolutely. Because I believe when someone, if you can do something for someone else, they may not be the one that returns the favor, mm. but somewhere down the line, someone will. Yes. So I'm always a believer that if I can do something for someone, that's what I'm going to do. Yes. Yes. And you don't have to give them a kidney, 
right? We're no, not looking no, at, it's no. not supposed to be this huge burden of, oh, I have to give right. so much. It's just, no, you know what? Can I, can I make an introduction? Can I recommend a, a book yes. or, uh, you know, invite you to check out the website? Cause maybe you'll like to be a member of SHRM or something right. else. It right. doesn't. Yeah. Little things make big little things. Exactly. Exactly. Love it. So speaking of little things, it's time for the 24 hour influence challenge. So this is your opportunity, Jackie, to speak directly to our audience and challenge them to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence. How yeah. would you like to challenge our listeners today? Yep. So you've heard me talk a little bit about this whole idea of value, the mm -hmm. value that you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. I would challenge the listeners to take a minute and write down what they think their value proposition is. Mm. What is the value that they bring that will they can then use to influence other people? So first knowing what you what you have and then using it to to um, influence others. So the first step, write down your value proposition. What would it, can you give an example of what's, what does a value proposition, a personal value proposition sound like? Yeah, it's, it's what is it that you do really well, that you're really good at? So for me, I consider my value proposition as someone who is really great at solving problems. Mm -hmm. I also see my value proposition as someone who has a broad breadth of knowledge in areas A, B, C, D, and E. Okay. Um, and I, I'm also very committed to doing the work that I'm passionate about. So if I just said those three things to someone um, and, and you know what I might ask them is, so using those things, how would you see the best way for me to you know, add value here, here, or here? Okay, so let's, let's scaffold out those three uh, elements that you just included. The first one was? Um, I, I'm very, I may not say them in the right order. I'm, I'm passionate and committed. Okay, so passion and, What's and passion committed. About? Mm -hmm. Yep. Passionate and committed okay. to, to doing things. I'm really good at solving problems. Problem solving. Okay. Yeah, that was the first Natural one, skill I think. set. Right. right. And I have some, some um, knowledge and capability in areas A, B, and C. Like what are the technical things that I bring to the table? For me, it's around human resources. Great. All right. So I'm, I'm actually writing that as we go and I'm going to put them in the show notes. So what you're passionate and committed about, what your Okay, my brain just lost the second one. It was the problem, the solving. problem solving. Okay, so your natural skill set. Yeah. Right? Your, your skill set and your knowledge and your, and your expertise. Yeah. Great. So you got that, everybody? You're going to write down, here's your little outline. Here's your fill in the blank structure to identify your own uh, value proposition, what you're passionate about, what your strengths are as far as your skill set is concerned, and what your knowledge and expertise area is. Did I get that right? That's right. That's right. All right, everybody. Take a couple of minutes tonight and identify your value proposition. I think that's so clarifying to really just distill who you are down to those major pieces. And I think it helps you to figure out, am I where I belong? Right. You know, what might be the next step for me? Or how can I just add more value or feel more fulfilled by mm -hmm. figuring out how to do this uh, more actively in, in my work or personal life or anywhere else? Am I right in this? Totally. Totally. You Love got it. that right, Laura. <laughs> all right. All right. I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting everything correctly and I, I love it. So this brings us then to guiding others on the journey. So when you think about things like succession planning and career advancement, whether it's in SHRM or, or when you're guiding some of your clients, et cetera, on how to do their hiring and promotional uh, practices, when you think about terms like executive presence, mm. leadership presence, command presence, the it factor that says somebody's a leader. How do you know it when you see it? Yeah. So I look for um, confidence, mm -hmm. how confident people are in what they say. Um, I look for humility mm -hmm. um, because that shows me how they react um, with others who are, you know, maybe in their organization or um, who they don't feel like they have to manage up to. Yes. And I look and I look for their ability to, to get results. Like, yes. what do they do to make things happen? I, mm. I think executive presence is different from just being a good leader. Mm. It's, it's, you know, it is a good leader and you have to demonstrate that by the way you show up. Yes. Yes. And I, I'd like that you, the first two that you included in particular, because there's such an important balance between confidence and humility. 
mm-hmm. and they do work together and they really should. And I think a lot of people forget that along the way. Yeah. So then when you're hiring or grooming somebody for a higher level leadership or executive position, communication skills that they need to have, what's on the must have list? And on the flip side, what's a red flag that would make you say, oh, Mm -hmm. no matter how good they are at X, I can't because of Y. Yeah. So um, I put a lot of stock in people's ability to be life learners. Because I believe that if you know how to learn new things, you can learn any new thing. So it is less important that you have done all these things before, Mm. but you know how to learn new things. I mean, if you look back at my career, um, I've changed careers several times. I started out as an engineer, you know, and then I went into HR. And now I, I um, have my own practice. So you need to know how to how to learn and do new things. So that's one of the things I look for in people who um, I'm looking to hire or promote, because the world changes. You have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to like move and shift, you know, as things change. Um, a red flag for me. Oh, and 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 people's ability to articulate that. That's mm-hmm. really important. So it's not just that you did it, it's what did you learn from that? Yeah. And how did you grow? And, and what how has that changed who you are? Um, so your ability to, to articulate that is really important to me. The red flag, on the other hand, is where people are very vague or they are very um, high level and they're not able to really give examples of real life things that they have done. Mm -hmm. They think they talk about things in um, in generalities. That to me is like a a non-starter. It makes me think they either didn't do it or they didn't learn from it. Yes, yes. It always reminds me of and I do a lot of interview prep, a lot of interview coaching for people who are you know, getting ready for that next level. And uh, that's whenever I hear the super general answers initially, it's like when I was teaching at high school or college and somebody would, in an essay test, they'd, they'd write out something that just made me think to myself, you just read the table of contents and that's as far as you got in the book, isn't it? That right. That's like, you know how to drop a few words, but right. there's absolutely no meat to this right. whatsoever. There are no details or, or facts or anything else. So, yeah. uh, you know, and people are afraid of getting too detailed, but yeah, you, you need some in there. So here's one that there's a real red flag for me if I'm interviewing people. You know, the, the standard question, um, like what are your development needs or, you know, what have you done different? What would you do differently? Or what mistakes have you made? You know, that kind of mm-hmm, question. Mm-hmm. And people say things like, oh, well, I wouldn't have done anything differently. Or, <laughs> you know, I did everything right. That to me is like, you know, mm-hmm. death by fire. Yes, yes. That right? just, actually, that's a great answer because they just saved you a whole lot of heartache, headache. That's right financial ache, all that kind of stuff. It's it's like, okay, thank you very much for hitting your own eject button out of that chair. Interview is over. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for playing. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200 on the way out. Right. Right. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. So you know what? You're talking about interviewing. So I'm going to detour for a second here because the the one question that I always hate getting asked on interviews and whether it's for for podcasts or, or for whatever else is the opening question. Tell me about yourself. It's so broad and you can figure out to an extent where, but give us the insight here. So you, as the HR expert, when, if someone on a job interview is asked, tell me about yourself with that giant broad swath, you've got a blank canvas, talk about anything you want. What's something to bear in mind? Give us a tip. Sure. I would say the thing that I'd, I'd most be looking for is something that's not on your resume. I want to know who you are as a person. So you need to think about what is it that you think is important for me to know? Um, I would, I'd like to hear more about um, how you think about your behaviors, how you think about how you do things, your techniques, not about what you were able to accomplish, because I can see that on your resume, not the jobs that you held, not the companies that you work for. That's not what I'm looking for. And just to give you a, an insider trick, it is my belief that the thing that separates good from great performance is behaviors. So that's what I want to hear about. I want to know if your behaviors are aligned with the ones that we feel are important for this job. 
Love it. Okay, everybody, did you hear that? Because if you did not, if you were daydreaming, you need to rewind <laughs> and catch up those last couple of minutes because when you're asked that question about tell me about yourself, these are great tips about the kinds of information that would be really valuable to share and really valuable for the interviewer to know about you that's not on your resume that they wouldn't otherwise know to ask. So this is super gold content, Jackie. <laughs> That content's going to bring us to the speed round. So oh these are three uh, yes, these these are three questions, topics that regularly come up in my coaching and training work, and a lot of people tend to just generalize them as black and white issues, even though we know that the world is shades of gray, and we want them to understand that, look, they're not alone in these struggles and that there are other ways to look at it and to, to grow. So I'm going to ask you for that binary first. And in a single word or phrase, I'd like to know where you stand and then we'll go from there. So first, public speaking, love it or hate it? Love, love it. And can you give everybody a tip for speaking with confidence, even if they don't feel it? Well, there's two things that are absolutely necessary to speak with confidence. Okay. The first, the first is know what you're talking about. Yep. Know more than the audience does, right? And the second is look good. Tell me about looking good. You want to have the confidence to know that you your um your outfit, your persona, everything really demonstrates what it is you're trying to get across. So for instance, if you are speaking to a very conservative group of people who, you know, everybody is dressed, you know, um, in business dress, you don't want to come up there with a casual, business casual look, mm -hmm. because automatically that, that like sets you apart in terms of um, them having confidence in what you say. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you dress for your audience. When I get ready to do a training program, I'm always very conscious of who it is I'm, I'm, um, I'm speaking to. Mm -hmm. And when I get dressed that morning, I may change clothes two or three times because uh, this doesn't quite give me the look that I, I want. Um, I want to be approachable or I want to be um, the person who is the subject matter expert or, you know, whatever that look is, it's important to make sure that you nail that going out because then that's something you don't have to worry about. Yes. And then when you speak with confidence, to me, that's what makes it more like fun. I yes. mean, even this experience for me, even this experience, I could say the same thing, right? Yes. Um, you know, doing, um, vi being videotaped is not one of my um, favorite things to do. I always feel like whenever I look back on it, it isn't quite like I would have had it, mm -hmm. but, but, I still do the two things that I just talked about. I want to know what I'm talking about and I want to make sure that I look the way I want, you know, people to um, engage with me or to see what I have done. Yes. And then, and then it becomes fun. Yes. And I want to qualify something there and tell me if I'm, if you're, if we're on the same page that when it comes to changing your outfit and dressing the role for different groups, et cetera, <clears throat> that it's still about being authentic. Right. It's not about trying to pretend that you're someone you're not so that they no. like you. No. It's just reckon. Look, you, you look in your closet, you have everything from gym shorts to black tie gowns and tuxedos, right? So it's right. In everything in between. You've got your suits, you've got your turtlenecks, you've got your t-shirts. So it's from your wardrobe. Which of these pieces do you want to pick that will help them relate to you exactly. better? Yes. Very well said, Laura. Very yeah, well said. I think said. people are so concerned because, you know, you mentioned it with regard to dress and it's an analogy that I often use because for me, it's often about teaching people how to adapt their speech to the group. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not about faking, but there are degrees of code switching that we all have to do. This is my podcaster, my, my public speaking person persona, but look, I have a four-year-old. <laughs> I don't talk to him like this. He'll right. stop playing with me. He will, <laughs> it will not work, right? So, but it's not that this is the real me and that's the fake me. Right. I adjust. And if I'm doing a, a guest lecture for a high school or an undergrad class at college, I'm, I'm going to adjust the examples that I use. I'm going to adjust the vocabulary that I use. I'm going to adjust the stories that I tell to, and I'm going to adjust the way that I dress. Right what I'm with them. And I'm not going to wear a blazer like I'm wearing today when I'm talking to a group of high school kids, but it's, it's still me. 
Right. And just understanding that you have all those colors inside you to adjust for the group is not inauthentic. That's right. And here's the, and here to me is the benefit of doing that is that when you have that out of the way, yes. you can become much more natural. Your, your, your natural persona really comes out when you have taken care of all those other things up front. Now you can really be authentic when you show up in front of people. Yes. Yes. Love it. Thank you. Last, uh, second to last one, introvert or extrovert? Where do you fall? Closet extra, closet introvert. <laughs> what is a closet introvert? It's someone who looks like an extrovert. Okay. But really is an introvert. And the reason why I say that is if you were to see me in a room of people, you would swear I was an extrovert. I can work a room, right? Okay. I'm very comfortable going up and speaking to people I don't know and really engaging with people and all of that. But under the covers is so exhausting for me to do that, mm. right? So that's why I feel like, um, you know, I like being around people, but I also get energy from being alone. Like, you know, sometimes yeah. I would prefer to just observe and not necessarily be in the mix. Yes. So that's why I say I'm a closet introvert. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and as a closet introvert, what's a natural strength of yours and what's an area for growth? Yep. So the natural strength is the ability to observe, and watch what's going on mm -hmm. um, around me without, you know, and, and what it allows me to do is to really understand things in a different way. I don't have to be the person who's like the first to speak and always have something to say sure. whenever, right. I don't have to be that person. And okay. it really allows me to use my um, big picture skills to put things together. Excellent. And and really create like an overall picture so that when I do speak, it is more from a position of of a body of knowledge rather than just one particular idea. Wait, let me get this straight. Think first, talk <laughs> second. That's the strength huh. of the introvert. <laughs> Interesting. Let's okay, everybody out there, you're gonna process this one too with me. Think first, talk second. This is deep. All right, and a, an area for growth, Jackie. Yeah, I think that um, I wish that I weren't it, that I didn't get so exhausted by um, the being around people all the time. Okay. Um, because I truly enjoy interacting with people. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I wish that, you know, I applaud people who do that naturally. For me, it, it is something I have learned to do. Yes, and I think that's, that's a challenge for a lot of people. So then finally, real quickly, handling conflict. Nobody loves it per se, at least not healthily, I would assume, but our natural DNA hardwiring is typically either to avoid at all costs or to dive in and just fix it head on. Mm -hmm. What's your natural DNA? Dive in. Dive in. And what have you learned about managing that tendency effectively? Yeah. yeah. The, the biggest thing that I have learned is that you have to be clear about why you're doing it. Mm. What is it you want to achieve by um, addressing this conflict? Is it that that you want to make someone feel bad or you want to um, make someone agree with you or you, you know, what some other reason? Yes. Because you, you can't address everything or you shouldn't try to address everything. And that if you understand like what your end goal, did, goal is, it really helps you determine if this is something that is worth going after or not. Yes, yes, great advice, thank you. Jackie, how can people learn more about you and JLHR Solutions or SHRM? Yeah, so actually um, feel free to visit my profile on LinkedIn. Um, there's lots of information there. You'll see some posts that I've made that I think really speak to some of the things that we've talked to today. Um, and as far as Philly Sherm, um, visiting phillysherm.org website or their LinkedIn page. They're also very active on social media, are also other good ways to learn. And if you are an HR professional and you're looking to connect with a um, um, a very um, articulate and um, um, subject matter expert HR people in the Philadelphia community, this is the place for you. We are a very welcoming organization. We love to bring new people in. And there's lots of ways for you to get involved, get engaged, or just learn for your own development. So and if you're not in Philadelphia? 
Well, now in today's environment, you can still connect with us because our, our programming is virtual now. Right. And in, in fact, we've had people who joined our symposium this year who were from Florida and Texas, mm. which was really surprising. So look us up. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm sure that you'll find a lot of things there that are um, helpful and that you might want to get involved in. So I encourage you to just take a look. Terrific. Jackie, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you for having me. This has been more fun than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for setting your expectations low. I appreciate that nice low bar to hurdle. So I had a great time. I hope everybody else out there had a great time listening. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in as always. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The host, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.